This is what it says. Bethlehem, though you are only a small, yet out of you will come a ruler. Amen. The big potential of smallness. And there's three things I want to share with you from that passage today. The first thing to really note is that a small place can birth global potential. A ruler whose origins are from the distant past. We've just sung it. The carol that we've just sung <laughs> makes the emphasis for us again. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was so insignificant that it didn't even feature in the towns and villages that were given to Judah by Joshua. So insignificant that even in the census we read about in Nehemiah, Bethlehem doesn't even crop up. So insignificant that even it's called Ephrathah to actually distinguish it from another Bethlehem that was always also existing at that time. So it has to be kind of marked out. This is the Bethlehem I'm talking about. This little, this little one. Just a few hundred, probably 600 people living there when Jesus was born. So insignificant. In fact, it had no real merit at all, apart from the fact that King David had been born there. And even if you visit it today, the attraction of Bethlehem to today is only about one thing. Just one thing going for it, and that is that Jesus Christ was born there. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a single tourist in Bethlehem today. There's nothing to kind of give it any credit apart from the fact that 2,000 years ago, in this tiny, small place, Jesus was born. It's just a small town, six miles south of Jerusalem. Now think about this. Almighty God, the Ancient of Days, the God that's worshipped by millions of angels day and night who cry holy, holy, holy before him. This awesome, amazing God is coming to planet Earth. He's coming down here to this planet Earth and he will be birthed in flesh through the womb of a virgin. So where will he land on this mission from heaven to earth? Where would he land? Think of it. What possible place would God choose? Well, of course, you've got the magnificent holy city, Jerusalem, with the, the walls of the city, the temple. You've got this fantastic city. Surely, if God's going to come to earth, he'll come to Jerusalem, this big place. But no, it wasn't. Micah says, no, when he comes, he'll come to you, O little town of Bethlehem. So it wasn't on the great historic walls of Jerusalem where the angels would sing. It wasn't to that great city of royalty that, that, that God would come and be birthed. No. It wasn't the temple priests that would get the announcement from the shepherds, and to you is born this day. No, no, that wasn't going to happen. It was Bethlehem, the small, to the shepherds who were despised. So the glory of God would not shine on, on Jerusalem the golden, but on Bethlehem the boring. Wow. Wow. Do you know what that shows us? That a sovereign God can birth greatness anywhere he chooses. Anywhere he chooses. You see, our God is not impressed by the things that impress us. Have you ever thought what impresses God? Have you ever thought that? You see, it's hard to be impressed by anything when you can do what God can do. I often think about, you know, you see somebody who's just bought a brand new water feature for their garden, cost it three hundred quid, and they've got these lovely trickles and all that kind of stuff, and they're, and they're showing the neighbours, look at my, look at my water feature. And God says, have you ever seen Niagara? <laughs> it's like, you're impressed by that, you know. It's like, what does it, do you know I looked in scripture, do you know what I think impresses God? Things that often we overlook. 
love, yeah. humility, and faith. That's what impresses God. He's not impressed by the same things as we are. And in this Christmas season, I want you to see today, and I really want you to see this today, that our God, Almighty God, can do something amazing and outstanding in a small town, in a small place. This is really, really important. Welcome to Mid Wales. To Mid Wales. Not talking about South Wales where the big towns and the big cities are. I'm talking about Mid Wales. You know, I often get introduced when I go to a conference to preach or to a church. They introduce me as Alan Hewitt from Newport. <laughs> Mid Wales. And every time I have to get up, I say, no, I'm not from Newport. I'm from Newtown. They all say, where's that? Where is Newtown? So let's bring Brecon into it this morning. You, Brecon. Though you are only a small town, yet out of you will come. And my question is, what? What will come out of you? What will come out of Brecon? And you know what the answer to my question is? Anything that God chooses. Anything that God wills can come out of Brecon. Anything that God wills can come out of this church. Because what God does is not dependent on earthly conditions. Because God makes his own conditions for what he wants to do. God can do something in Brecon that could be talked about across the nation. Now if you don't believe that, there's something wrong. There is something wrong. And I want to call upon you today to believe in your church and to believe in its potential for great things. I want you to believe in it. Your church does not have to be in Chicago or London, or Sydney, or New York, for God to do great things. Reckon Mid Wales is okay, because God can do something here. Don't reckon you are only a small town, yet God says, I can do this, I can birth this, I can do something here. I call upon you to believe in the young people here, in your church, believe in them, though they are small, Believe in them. Believe in them. Leaders can come from them. Missionaries can come from them. Musicians can come from them. Christian artists can come from them. Believe in your young people. You see, what God has in their lives, you may not see yet, but they can be used by God to bring about miracles. They can birth songs. Listen, can't angels sing in Brecon? Can't wonderful things happen in Brecon? Can the glory of God shine in Brecon? Of course it can. You see, the Bible says this, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. As far as last time I looked, Mid Wales, Paris, Mid Wales, was still on earth. So if Mid Wales is still on earth, and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, there's hope for God to do something amazing in this place. You need to believe in your potential. You need to believe that what God can do is not limited to what we see in the natural. Believe in your young people. And also, believe in the old people in this church. Believe in the old people. You see, old people are not people that have reached pension age and are now waiting to die. <laughs> it's really important. Because in some people's mindset, that's it. I've reached this certain age, and from now on, that's it. My life, I, I don't know how long I've got left. I'm just going to wait here now and do my radishes and my lettuces and my tomatoes, and then one day they're going to find me under the cabbages, and that's it. No, 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 no. There's a better, better future for you than that. Yeah. Believe in the old people. You that are kind of more mature in age, just, just understand this. Though you are this, and though people may see and think this about you, etc., 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 
God has still got a plan for your life. You're just like Bethlehem was marked out. God's got a plan for you. You're marked out for greatness. God can still speak through you. God can still write through you. God can still intercede through you. God can still give you dreams and visions. You don't have to be big and famous and well known to be used by God. God has planted this church in Brecon to burn more than people think possible. And if you're going to say amen at all, you need to say amen to something like that which concerns you. This church is not here by accident. This church didn't just happen. This church has been planted here with great potential in a small town. You need to believe that. Don't ever let your location determine your potential. This is a small place. That's okay. A small place is okay. But small plans are not okay. Small dreams are not okay. Never believe the lie that God can only do great things in a big place. It's not true. You know, there's little wealth in uh, Bethlehem. But as we know, birthing costs something. There's always a cost of birthing it. And there was very little 600 people living in Bethlehem. No great wealth, no great finance there. But you know, God is able to get money where he needs to get it. Remember the wise men, it probably took them a year to get to Bethlehem. At least a year. And when they arrived, they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh and laid it at the family's feet. And that would have probably been the greatest wealth that had ever been in Bethlehem. And there it was now given to Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. That's what God can do. You see, God doesn't need there to be a huge world bank in Bethlehem in order to fund what God was doing. God can fund what he funds. He can do what he wills. That's still our God today. He can get resources where he needs them. He can get resources, all that this town needs, all that this church needs, God can get resources to you. He has no problems with creating resources. You know, I came from Manchester 37 years ago after pastoring a church there for 13 years. And now, having been on the staff at Newtown Hope Church for 37 years, I came from a big city to a small town. And yet, in that small town, I have seen God do greater things than I ever saw God do in the city of Manchester. In a small town, I think you're around about 9,000 a year, we're about 11,500. Two small towns in Mid Wales. And people just think, what can, what can be done in Mid Wales? Christmas is a great reminder that God still works in small places. Nothing can stop him. And have you ever noticed this? That Many, many, many of the miracles of Jesus happen in small places. Places like Cain and Cana and Nain. Places like Bethany. God often did wonderful things in small places. I want to try to get across this message to you today. As we sing a carol about Bethlehem, I want to remind you that God can birth great potential through a small place. Second thing I want you to see is this, is that a small deed can accomplish a great thing. There's a danger of us thinking that it's only the big that matters, and that means if we only think the big matters, what we do, we demean the small thing. When we built in our nursing home in Newtown, we opened it 21 years ago, a care home for the elderly, it cost us two and a half million pounds. We raised that funds, and during that time, people criticised us, saying, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing this. This is, this is too big a project for you to do this. And, you know, you don't know nothing about nursing care, you don't know this and this kind of stuff. And at that time, 
you know, I was probably the only person on staff at the church. We did some good volunteers. But it took us six years, but we actually built it and opened it, and it's there today as something which stands there, as something which people said could never be done, but was done, because people didn't just believe and think that you had to be big in order to accomplish something big. We, we opened our day nursery 14 years ago, and that now employs 20 people. And with the church staff now, we employ as a small church in Mid Wales over 100 people, giving them jobs, serving the community, for the children in the community, the old people in the community. And, and it's like these things can only happen in a small place when someone believes it, when someone believes that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even imagine. We need to understand that a small deed, small deeds can accomplish great things. If you think that you have to do something big in order to do something that's useful, then you'll never, well, what you'll do, you'll actually be waiting for the big opportunity and never realize the small opportunities that are all around you. For example, thinking big can paralyze us, especially when it comes to being relevant and doing something that blesses people at this time of the year. You see, if we think that the only gifts that matter are the expensive gifts, and then we can't afford those gifts, we'll think that we can't give. But it's not true, it's not true. If we neglect the small gift, because it's small, then we rob people of a blessing who would think that that small gift would be really big in their lives thinking that only the expensive is worth something means that we actually rob people of the blessing of the spoils that we could actually pass something into their life. Let me give you an example, a practical example. The longest river in England actually comes from Wales. <laughs> I just love that. It flows through our town. Its source it's not a major city. There's no big buildings where it's sourced. There's nothing huge, nothing big. It's about 20 miles away from Newtown, up north of the place. And you can go there, and there's a little sign that says, the source of the seven. And it's a bog. <laughs> just marshland. It's just wet. You can sink your feet in it. It's just, you won't drown there. It's just like, just marsh. It's a bog. That's the source of the seven. And it goes from there for 220 miles, all the way to England. You see, the biggest river in England is not the Thames in London, it's the Severn that comes from Wales. And it flows there, and you know what? It starts as a marsh, a bog, and it ends up five, six miles wide when it goes into the Bristol Channel, Severn Estuary. But you see, that big, long, 220 miles river is only there because of a bog. No bog, no river. It's the small, the small, the small thing that can accomplish a great thing. The Chicago fire, if you've ever been to Chicago, you know you've got the big towers and you can see and they have all these images of Chicago when there was a fire there in 1871. The Chicago fire did not, did not start as a big fire. It started, they say, because a lady was milking a cow with a kerosene lamp. The cow kicked over the lamp, set fire to the straw, and that meant that there was a blaze a mile long, and a mile wide, and three miles long, and it only left two buildings standing in the whole of Chicago. Huge thing started with a small thing. When we were in Manchester, we passed a church called Failsworth, which was halfway between Oldham and Manchester, in a city. And we loved it, it was great. And when I went there, I was straight from Bible school, I was 24, my wife was 21, and we took over uh, this, this little church. And the church had a, had a kind of a practice whereby there was a, a wooden table in front of the pulpit, and there was always a vase of flowers on that table. 
And uh, left to me, I would never have even thought about putting a vase of flowers on a table in front of the pulpit. But it was done. And it was done by a lady called Joyce. But she's still alive now. She's 90 years of age. And uh, she, what she did every Sunday, those flowers, at the end of the day, she put them, wrapped them in paper, and she wrote a little card on them that said this on the card. These flowers have been associated with the worship in God's house today. We trust they will be a blessing to you. And she'd take them at the end of every Sunday to someone that was in need, someone that was sick, someone that was lonely. And we had people saved from those flowers because what would happen is the people that received them would want to know what this church was like that sent them the flowers. And they came into the meetings and they got saved. It was a simple, simple, costless little act but it had fantastic consequences. And I want to encourage those of you today, because there must be people in this church today who you do small things. Was it St. David that said, do the little things? You know, you, those of you that do things that nobody knows about, that never get broadcast, but you do a simple deed, you, do a, you send a simple card, you may make a meal to someone that's not very well, you do the simple things. I want to commend you today, because your simple acts of kindness can be an enormous blessing. You see, few of us, few of us will ever be able to write six-figure sum checks to our churches. But you do need to realize this: that most churches don't actually survive or get by by one or two large checks. They get by because regular people, week by week, are faithful in giving their tithes and offerings. That's how churches survive. It's because lots of people do small things, not a few big people do. Now we end things. It's so very important. Very important. Ask yourself this question. What small, simple thing could come from you this Christmas that would make it a big time experience in the life of someone else? You know, very few of us would ever be able to feed 200 people. But if 200 people feed one person, we don't get to we all be one inch. It's the small things that add to the big things. We just make sure that you don't have a mindset. I mean, it's not big, it's not important, because it's not true. Have you ever thought of how significant just one person is? How many people did it take to help the person that had been moved on the Jericho Road? Have you ever noticed that it's Samaritan is in the singular? It's not the good Samaritans. It's a Samaritan. One. Just one. How many women did it take to actually save the Jews from annihilation in the book of Esther? Just one Esther. Just one woman. How many boys' lunches did it take for Jesus to use to feed the 5,000? Just one boy's girl lunch. Just one. How many sheep had to be lost before the shepherd went looking? Just one. Just one. You see, it's a small thing. Again, it's a small thing. And the Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 19 about one. It says, one sinner destroys much good. Just one. You don't have to have lots of sinners to make a big problem. Just one can do that. You've probably heard these facts before, but they're very really interesting. The fact that it was one vote that gave Oliver Cromwell control of England in 1645. <coughs> one vote in 1776 gave USA the English language instead of French. One vote in 1875 changed France from a monarchy to a republic. One vote, November the 8th, 1923, in a Munich pub, elected Adolf Hitler to be the leader of an extreme political party. We don't know the names of those people, just the ones whose vote counted. We don't know their names, but history was changed. You don't have to be known to accomplish a big thing. <coughs> this quote from an American preacher, Vance Havner, I think is really helpful. So many of us are not big enough to become little enough to be used of God. Yeah. So many of us are not big enough to become little enough to be used of God. I love the story of John Eglin. John Eglin is a, a guy that you'll never find in a Madame Tussauds wax museum. But he's a, an, an amazing character to me. And this is his story. It was on a morning like this, actually, in Colchester. January the 6th, 1850. He was 26 years of age. And he woke up on that morning, Sunday morning, and it was freezing. The snow was deep outside, 
um, about a foot deep, anywhere in Colchester was deep in snow. And he, he thought about snuggling down and getting back under the blankets and saying, oh, I'll just skip church today. But then he realised, I'm a deacon, and if I don't go, I ought to go. So he didn't. Can I just say, by the way, churches need more people that turn up rather than turn over. It's so easy to turn over. You know, when you know you should be somewhere, it's so easy just to, oh, no, I won't go, I won't go, go. Better to turn up than turn over. So what he did, he trudged six miles in a foot of snow, got to the little primitive Methodist chapel. And uh, when he got there, he found that the preacher was snowed in, who he couldn't, couldn't get there. And there was just 12 members turned up. And then there was one 15-year-old lad turned up. So they took, discussed amongst themselves, these 12 members, well, let's just cancel the service. Let's just cancel today. Because we have got a preacher, there's only 12 of us here, and this 15-year-old teenager. So John Eglin said, I'll preach. And he never preached in his life. Never preached in his life. So they held the service. And he did preach. And he preached from Isaiah 45, 22. And this was the text. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. And the historical account says that he spluttered on for 10 minutes. And they say that there was more passion than material. He just kept going on and on and on, <laughs> quoting this text, firing it out. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved, be saved. And then finally, he noticed this 15 year old lad sitting at the back underneath the balcony. And he looked at this, and I quote exactly his words. He said, young man, you look very miserable, and you will always be miserable, miserable in life and in death. If you do not obey this text, look to Jesus, look, look, look. And he stopped, that was the end of the sermon. But the young man, 15 years of age, did look, and he was converted. He went home and told his mom, who was absolutely ecstatic, and she said, I've been really praying for you, I've been praying for you. Three months later, he was baptised. And this was his testimony. I did look, and there and then the cloud lifted from my heart, and the darkness rolled away. One year later, at 16, he preached his first sermon. At 17 years of age, he became a pastor of a small church in London. Because that 15 year old boy was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who's known now as the Prince of Preachers. He was the greatest preacher in London of his day. In fact, in his day in London, the Metropolitan Tabernacle was the largest church in the world. And he got saved because a deacon turned up instead of turning over. A simple, small act. Thousands Scores of thousands of people were saved from his church. Orphanages were set up. Training colleges for preachers were set up. And in his testimony, Charles Spurgeon said this, and I'm going to quote from exactly his words. He said, the minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up. At last, a very thin-looking man, a shoemaker or tailor or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. Now, it is well that preachers be instructed, but this man was really stupid. That's a nice thing to say about the preacher. <laughs> he was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. The text was, look unto me and be ye saved or the ends of the earth. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. Because between half past ten, when I entered that chapel, and half past twelve, when I was back again at home, what a change had taken place in me. Simply by looking to Jesus, I had been delivered from despair. And I was brought into such a joyous state of mind that when they saw me at home, they said to me, something wonderful has happened to you. And I was eager to tell them all about it. Oh, there was joy in the household that day when all heard that the eldest son of 17 children had found the Saviour and knew himself to be forgiven. You know, that was the, to our knowledge, the first and the last time that John Abram had ever preached. The first and the last time. And he probably never actually ever knew what that 10 minute sermon 
ever produced. You see, we just think sometimes we've got to have the big name preachers, we've got to have the entourage, we've got to have them doing this and this and this and this and then we think, let me just tell you a little thing that, was, that, that I was convicted of many, many years ago. I was in South Africa and uh, I was at a conference and then the thousands were there and they were going to have a fire trouble. That meant that they were going to have two sides of the auditorium and Reinhard Bonnke was on one side and then Ray McCauley was on the other side. And, and everybody, everybody knew was going to go through a fire tunnel where they were going to be zapped, prayed for by one of these preachers. So I looked up and I thought, who do I want? Which one do I want? Which one do I want? So I want Ray McCoy, I do want Reinhard Bonnke, I think. I want Reinhard, so I looked at the Reinhard Bonnke queue. And then I realised that I'm not close, I was in the wrong queue. I had to be the other queue, now God really committed me. He said, which one do you want, what do you want me? And I thought, yeah, you see, we can get so thinking, oh, it's got to be a big name. It's amazing when you get a visiting preacher come to the church and they make an appeal, they always get more people to respond than the local pastor does. Because the people often think, if that person comes, if that person preaches, if that person prays for me, no, 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 no. You can be a John Hickland. God can use you for his glory. A small, so that's firstly, a small place can work global potential. Secondly, a small deed can accomplish a great thing. But thirdly, the insignificant is changed when Jesus comes. Little Bethlehem would be forever remembered because of the presence of Jesus Christ. This Christmas around the world, Bethlehem will be on the lips of millions, perhaps billions of people because of that one thing that happened 2,000 years ago. Today, Bethlehem only has 20,000 people. And this year, something like 2 million visitors would have gone through Bethlehem. 65% of its income is from tourism. And it's all about just one thing that happened. Just one thing that happened. Bethlehem is known as the birthplace of Emmanuel. That's it. Heaven landed there. Now think about this. Out of 8 billion people on earth today, think about this. Have you ever thought how small, insignificant, unimportant you are? Have you ever thought, little me, what? What possibly can I do with my life that's going to actually make a huge difference? What claim to fame? Do I have? Do you have? Do you think that Eden Church Brecon is just simply another church? Just another church in a small town, one amongst thousands? Is it? Or is it more than that? Is it something that God, in his heart and mind and will and purpose, has put here? be marked and talked about because of his presence being in this place. Though you are small, yet how do you will come? Do you realize that this church is part of the body of Christ? That means that the body of Christ is incomplete without you. You are essential. Our church, Newtown, is essential. Our two churches in Powers, Mid Wales, the whole, doesn't matter how big the church is on parts of the world, there may be 70,000, 100,000, 20,000, 10,000. The body of Christ worldwide is incomplete without our churches because we are part of the body of Christ. That means we are, we can never look down upon ourselves and feel sorry for ourselves or think that we're nothing. Though we are small, yeah, but though we are small, we believe that out of us will come something that will bring great praise and glory to God. You know what put, Beth what put Bethlehem on the map? Was the presence of Jesus. What puts us today in a place of honor is the presence of Jesus, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, listen, when you walk through this town, walk with your head held high. 
You're a child of God. You know, you're carrying something divine in you. He has birthed his presence in your life, in your heart. Christ is not in you because you are great, but you are great because of his presence in you. The Bible says we who are not a people are now the people of God. Paul writes this, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things, the weak things, the lowly things, so that no one may boast before him. The only boast that Bethlehem had was God's grace in making it the birthplace of Jesus. And you know, that meant that Bethlehem could take no glory in it, no pride in it. It couldn't say he was born in us because of the great universities in our city. No. It had nothing, no claim to fame at all. Its only boast was Jesus was born here. And look at your life and my life. Let me tell you something. The greatest boast any of us can have today is that we are children of God. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in you. Not because of how much you've got, not because of how big your car is, or how big your house is, or how many degrees you've got. No, no, no. The only boast we have is what Paul boasts. Paul says, I will boast in nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We are blessed. You are blessed. I am blessed. We are blessed because God doesn't think I have to have the bid in order for me to use them for his glory. He takes hold of people like us. So we see those three things here today about how that small place can birth something of global potential. How that small deed can actually make something that's so very, very special and important. And how that in the scripture we see this passage here today, that the insignificant is changed when Jesus comes. I want today for you to realize that in these days when there's chaos out there in the world, there's chaos in people's homes, there's chaos in people's lives, there's chaos in people's finances and situations. There are people today that are desperate and they need this church to be at the top of its game. They need you to be the best church you can be. And you need to be a church that believes that actually your future is better than your past and that God's got the potential and the power and the ability and the grace in order to take something and do something in you in this town that can mean massive blessings to others and most of all can bring great glory to Jesus Christ. May God bless you.